It's been enormously embarrassing to Floyd Lane. Yeah. He was one of the uh, African-American players on the team because he was not in the first group that was, that was charged. Right. And so everybody thought that, that Floyd Lane was, you know, kept apart, was, was apart from it and kept himself clean and pure. And so he was carried around the campus on, on people's shoulders. He was declared the captain of the team, and they built a new team around him, and Floyd, was, uh, Floyd Lane was a hero. And then it was discovered he was involved. Yeah. So it, it yeah. had to be, for 10 days, yeah. he yeah. had to, to live with ghosts. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. he was being acclaimed that he knew he was one of them and didn't know whether to admit it or not admit it. If yeah. you admit it, yeah. it's a criminal offense. Yeah. You know, you know, and you point out in the book, uh, Adolf Rupp, of course, uh, now it's uh, been 50 years, one can say it all right, he was a complete bigot. Yes, and every, he was. Everybody in the country knew it. Yes, he was. Uh, uh, he even once said he will never have an African, a black uh, player, an African-American player mm -hmm. on his team. Uh, Fog Allen of Kansas might not have been better. And when the scandal hit, they said, oh, that's just those Eastern. Now, that was a code word for uh, Eastern, uh, Jewish, and Italian, and Irish kids from New York City. And then it turned out that their teams were involved up to here, including oh, yeah. his uh, uh, Rupp's great Kentucky team, that's which right. before UCLA might have been the greatest team that ever Easily played basketball. The best. Yeah, Easily the best. Uh, yeah, they had been doing it, but, but not in, in arenas like Madison Square Garden. They, they were dumping games in their own field houses. <laughs> Rupp's famous statement is they couldn't touch my boys with a 10-foot pole. That, yeah. was, that was his statement. And of course, that game that when Kentucky, which was the, Kentucky was the defending champion that year. And they came to Madison Square Garden to play City College in the NIT. And Kentucky was a huge favorite. The story goes, I think Marvin Kalb told it, uh, that when th they went to touch hands, the, the opposing players, uh, Floyd Lane put out his black hand to, I think it was Bill Spivey's white hand, and he withdrew it. And Lane presumably said to him, boy, you're going to be picking cotton in the morning. Yeah. And, and then and they, they ran away with the game. 89 to 50. Yeah. The biggest defeat in the history of, of, of Kentucky. Yeah. They were playing, remember, without a 24-second clock. Right. And put up 89 points. Right. Which is like scoring 140 today. Yeah. Right. So they, they just ran him into the yeah. ground. That, that was vengeance. That was... Yeah, I mean, th they they were doing that for, uh, for for ghosts of the Holocaust. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's uh, one of the things Cobb says. Uh, Adolf was coming. Imagine that Adolf is coming Adolf, to New York that's City. Right. T explain how the basketball point shaving scandals worked. They weren't throwing games, no. although it may be, and you can comment on this, that because of attempts to shave points, they lost games that they otherwise might have won. Some of these teams. Yeah. But uh, it was not a, a, a question generally of dumping games. No. It was a question of shaving points. Explain how that whole betting scene operated. All, right. All basketball betting is done on a point spread. So the odds maker establishes that one team, let's say Kentucky in this game, was a seven-point favorite over City College. Right. Now what happens when you bet either way, you either give or lay the points. If you're taking Kentucky, they're a seven point favorite. Kentucky has to win by more than seven for you to collect. If you're betting the underdog, you take the seven, and if they lose by fewer than seven points, you win the game. So the idea was that they would, they would bribe players to stay at, with At seven them. points, the bookie takes it all. Is that right? No, seven points, it's a push. Oh. Nobody wins. Yeah, okay. Oh, I say, okay, right. Yeah. Okay. What the bookie tries to do, you see, bookies are not gamblers, they're businessmen. <laughs> yeah, right. And what they try to do is balance the books, because when you make a bet, you lay 11 to 10. So that if you're betting $50 on a game, you've got to put up 55. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You lose, you lose 55. You win, you lose 50. If he gets bets even on both sides, you win, you win he 50. automatically wins, takes 10% of, of, of yeah. half the handle. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that's what a bookmaker is trying to do. Uh, a bookmaker's worst enemy is, is a fixer, because yeah. he's going to get killed. Yeah, yeah. So what, what these fixers would, would do, wasn't it, is they were, they were bribing these kids yeah. to win by less than the spread. Right. The bookmaker would, I mean, I mean, the gambler, the fixer, would bet on the underdog. That's right. And, and when the underdog held the, the favorite below the spread. Exactly. The that was the whole idea. Just win the game, but stay within the spread. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, of course, if the spread is three points, you have a lot of trouble. Yeah, right. Uh, how, uh, how, uh, 
the ball players, you, you say the ball players consider this a sort of double win. They would win the game and they would win, <laughs> they That's would right. get money for holding the points they down. Win yeah, you could win twice. Yeah. But what, what happened very often is that a team, particularly a team like City College, which was not a great team in the sense that, that Kentucky was, they played great together. Mm -hmm. But they didn't have great, they didn't have uh, Groza and Beard and Wawa Jones and so forth. Right. They had trouble staying within the spread. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's very difficult to do. It, 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 it's tough to control what happens on a court. Generally, if, you, if you're looking to dump a game, you try to do it on defense mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. instead of uh, missing wild shots mm -hmm. uh, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, LIU, which was the big powerhouse in New York then with yeah. Sherman White yeah. and, and, and Dolph Bigos, yeah. uh, Sherman White was the best player in the country at the yeah. time. Yeah, he was about 6'11", wasn't he? Well, not, not quite that big, but 6'9", which was like 6'11 yeah. for that time. Yeah. And he, he, he could do it all. He, he shot outside. He was like Julius Irving uh -huh, was going to be. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, LIU was able, to, most of the games, almost every game that they try to control, they were able to win the game while staying under the points. Yeah, yeah. Because part of the reason was the points tended to be high yeah, on an yeah, LIU game. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that uh, Kentucky's great team of 48-49, the, the Ralph Beard, the Wawa Jones, Alex Groza team, Groza, uh, incidentally, for the audience, was the brother of Lou Groza, the famous uh, Cleveland Brown yeah. place uh, player. Do you think that they lost uh, their game in the NIT uh, deliberately or by accident as a result of uh, trying to stay below the spread? Which, you know, you can lose if you turn cold and so mm -hmm. on. I don't know. Uh, you know, people have uh, ruminated about that. I, I would tend to doubt it. Uh, there was never evidence of any game that I can recall, anyway, be, being dumped or taking the points in a tournament. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When the tournament came, it was one game and out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I don't think teams were ready to risk winning a tournament yeah, uh, yeah. In, in order to, to uh, yeah, shape the yeah. points. Now, Stan, you say in your book, uh, which I well understand, it's a fascinating point in, in, at many levels. It has to do, among other things, with the difference between the truth as understood in the street and the truth uh, as it needs to be proven in a court of law. You say in your book that every kid in the schoolyard who played basketball knew that shaving was going on. Yeah. Uh, and yet, the coaches, uh, Holman and others, uh, F uh, Forty Anderson of Bradley, which was a major power in those days, claimed that, geez, we didn't know. Uh, Anderson said that he watched the movie of a game 17 times, still didn't understand what plays had been a result of fixing prices, of uh, fixing points. Uh, Holman said very sagely, you know, you can detect mistakes, you can't detect the motivation for those mistakes. Right. Uh, but nonetheless, given all the gambling that was prevalent in the garden, in the Catskills, which you can explain, uh, God, how could, and all the evidence that would pile up about pulling games off the books, uh, uh, mm -hmm. off the boards, uh, how did the coaches not know what was going on? Coaches, for the most part, I think, live with the same kind of blinders that fathers live with when they're talking about their children. How could you not have known that he was taking drugs all these years? How mm. could you not, not have known that he was in with a, a, a criminal group? And very often they don't. They begin with a disposition. Holman particularly was a, a, a very patrician, uh, moralistic type of man. Uh, and I think this seemed completely foreign to him. There are people, I, I must say, who disagree with me, say he, he must have known. Uh, I personally doubt that he did. It's also very difficult to detect. First of all, I mean, you need to re remember that you're playing, that these are 18, 19-year-old kids who are playing. And they make mistakes. They shoot at the wrong time. Uh, they make other mistakes on the court. Uh, offensively, they throw the ball. I mean, you've seen any number of times a guy throws a bounce pass and there's nobody there. Well, he thought the guy was going to cut, but he didn't cut. Yeah. Uh, and on defense, it's, it's very difficult to detect it. On defense, you just react half a second slower and the man is yeah, by you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you disagree with me because we've discussed this, but uh, uh, on City Dump, they showed as allegedly being exemplary of, uh, of some uh, uh, attempts to uh, shave points, shots that are so unbelievable mm -hmm. that, you know, when I see something like that, I say, God, unless these guys can't play, <laughs> and the movies show that, my God, they could play. You know, jeez, jeez, you just wonder about this. You yeah. know. 
And of course, in those days, well, why don't you explain the Catskills, too, and the gambling in the garden? That, that was a major point of, that is being made by people like Murray Sperber, the famous mm -hmm. sports com uh, common academic commentator on sports. Why don't you discuss the okay. gambling in the garden and the Catskills? Okay. Uh, the Catskills at the time were a haven for uh, uh, basically Jewish minorities uh, who went up there for uh, a week or two. And they hired college ball players presumably to work as waiters, busboys, uh, around the hotel. For the most part, the jobs that they were given were perfunctory. Right. And they were really being played to play basketball. And there were some tremendous basketball games played up there uh, by good college players, one at one Catskill Hotel, one at another. Yeah, I mean, up to the level of people like Cousy in the Sherman exactly. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. These are top players. And, and people would bet on the games. They would bet on, on win-lose, because there was no point spread because the teams were made up of an right. of, 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 of odd group of players. Uh, they would bet on total points. There, there are a lot of ways to bet basketball games. Right. And there'd be large pools of money involved. Right. And you'd get some big-time gamblers like Salvatore Salazzo, who was the brains of this whole operation, who would go up there and, and right there start buying off players. Yeah, yeah. Now, it's a lot easier to say we have a game between uh, the Neverly and, and Klein's Hillside that I'm going, <laughs> I'm going to lay down a little bit than, than a college, than yeah, a college yeah, game. Yeah. It doesn't seem to matter. Okay, and even right in the garden, people were, uh, money was changing hands and people were making book right in the garden. Yeah, one of the phenomena that always interests me in the garden, it still, ha it still happens all the time, uh, is that you have a game where one team is leading by 15 points the last two minutes of the game, and you hear people screaming, <laughs> Take the shot! Don't you know? Yeah. Don't hold the ball out, you yeah. because they laid the points and they need another basket to yeah. cover. Yeah, <laughs> it's still going on, huh? Oh sure. Uh, um, uh, we have to take <laughs> we have to take another break. Stay with us. After this break, we'll be right back for the third segment of our show with Stanley Cohen on his book, The Game They Played. <laughs> Every time an adult gives up on our kids, every time we surrender to the belief that their future is out of our hands, another child is left behind. I'm General Colin Powell, but I don't believe in giving up. That's why I'm asking you to join America's Promise. Log on to americaspromise.org or give us a call. Whoever you are, wherever you are, you can do something important. Pull your weight. They won't leave you for someone younger. They won't notice you've gained weight. They won't fire you. They won't talk about you behind your back. All they'll ever do is love you. Find the love of your life. Visit PetFinder at ASPCA.org. You know how inquisitive kids are. That's why you store sharp objects in a safe place. Keep medicines out of reach. And if you have a gun, you keep it unloaded and locked away. As concerned members of the television community, we urge you to be just as careful with television. Kids don't always know what they're watching. That's why you should. Mister. You drop this? Maybe the last thing you would do for somebody. Have a good day, sir. You should be the first. A message from the Credit Union Foundation hey, and your hometown credit union. Welcome back. Stan, in the book, you talk about some of the reasons why the, uh, every kid in the street knew that these games uh, were the subject of a fix. Reasons such as uh, the games being pulled from the boards or influxes of last minute money. Explain what all of this means and what will explain how the people knew that something wasn't right in the state of Denmark, so to speak. Well, b bookmakers know more about what's going on 
behind the scenes than anybody else. A bookmaker knows that a guy is injured about an hour before he sprains his ankle. <laughs> you know. So if, if anything happens, there are people who watch these things for, especially in local games. Yeah. yeah. And if anything is off or wrong, they tell them. Yeah. Now, when you go to the local bookmaker, and he's got a game pulled, there's such a thing in gambling called, uh, to, just to interject, uh, called a, a game is circled. Mm -hmm. When a game is circled, that means that there's some problem with the game, and they know it, and they're telling it to you. Uh, in football, usually the quarterback sprained his thumb or something. And so the spread is there, and it's circled. In games like this, when a game is pulled from the board, and the bookmaker says, I'm not taking any action on that game, it means either that somebody is really likely to be injured not playing, and nobody else knows it, or more likely, he believes that there's some kind of fix in. When one team gets pulled week after week like LIU was, yeah, 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 and you couldn't get any bets in on that game, yeah, I mean, now you know that the bookmaker knows something. Yeah. Where yeah. he knows something from, you don't know, but he has people talking to people or, or whatever. Yeah. And it's not the type of thing anyone can prove. Yeah. Right. But right. you don't need proof. Yeah, yeah. You know, and also, you mentioned in the book, LIU kept winning games, but by less than the spread. Right. That's right. And that was like a dead bang tip off to the street. Yeah, and, and they, were, they were able to do it and do it well. Uh, and one of the reasons the spreads on their games tended to be inflated, they were high because they were that good. So it's easy to stay under a 12-point spread. But they were also so good, they, they, would, they could fall behind mm -hmm. by three, four points and figure we'll, we'll catch them in the last two minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, one of the interesting things, which I've alluded to before, Stan, is uh, in a court of law, you have to have all this evidence, mm -hmm. uh, you know, by a preponderance of the evidence or beyond a reasonable doubt, depending on whether it's civil or criminal. So, you know, the bad guys stay out of jail and so forth, because, but the street knows. The street oh, yeah. doesn't require the same amount of evidence. That's right. You don't, you don't need any evidence at all. Yeah. You know, it, it's almost perverse, because at one point you say, well, nobody was ever convicted. That's proving that it was happening. That's, that's <laughs> right. That's right. They yeah. knew. Yeah. Explain who Junius Kellogg was and how he came to blow the whistle on the fix. Junius Kellogg was, was a hero of, of uh, you know, e e enormous dimension. He was a tall African-American player, my tendency to call him Negro, that's what you called him then, that's what I call him in the book, uh, who played for Manhattan College. Mm -hmm. Now, Man Manhattan College had been dumping games before that. Hank Poppy was involved, Burns was involved, a number of people were involved in that. When Kellogg came, Kellogg, first of all, was from Virginia which is not unimportant because he didn't have the New York standards of what passed for street virtue that New York players have. That's an important thing to consider in, in this. Uh, Would street virtue include you keep your mouth shut? Yeah, you don't rat. You don't rat. You know, uh, no, no matter what it is, unless somebody's going to get killed, you don't rat out your teammates or your friends. Right. You know, you don't turn them we, in. We have it up here, too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, when they came to Kellogg and offered him money to, uh, to go along, they had to get Kellogg because when he came up, he was a tremendous power on that team. They offered him the money, and he didn't know what to do. He contacted the district attorney's office and told them, and they, they said, to a To so a kid like Kellogg, an African-American kid from Virginia where discrimination was in full flower, this was his way out, and he knew, if I understand correctly, mm -hmm. that if he fails to report it, and it is discovered that he failed to right. report it, he loses his scholarship, Everything and his life's that. over. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And, and he didn't have the conflict that the New York kids had. Uh, you know, if, if you envision, people say, why did, why did so many of them go along with it? You only needed, really, one or two who wanted to act as the intermediaries. After that, a player who was not involved was confronted with the worst of Hobson's choices. He could do one of three things. He could say, okay, I'll go along. He could say, well, I won't go along, but I'm not gonna say anything about it because the worst thing you can do is, uh, is, is turn in your teammates. And so now he's obliged to play a game knowing that there might be, but he's not sure in this game, two of his teammates not playing too hard. Yeah, yeah. The third thing he could do is go turn him in, which, which is against all the rules he ever grew up with. Right. So he had no good choice. 
And it probably seemed to some of them, like Eddie Roman, who, went, who got into this late, that the easiest thing is, is, is just to go along with it. I can't turn him in. Mm -hmm. I don't want to play mm -hmm. when I, I know mm -hmm. this guy is throwing passes to the crowd. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's what he was confronted with. Junius Kellogg did not have that conflict. Right. He, right. he had a different set of values, and he turned in. And once, once he blew the whistle on the Manhattan College players, the DA's office began to investigate to see how much further it went. And it went lots further. Oh. Yeah. Uh, and and you, you point out that this was going on all over the country, but only in New York did they take uh, strong legal action mm -hmm. against the players. The rest of the country sort of whitewashed it. And you put that in the context of small town America and its differences from New York City. Why don't you elaborate a little bit on what you were thinking about, what, what you meant by all of that? Well, the small towns tend to take care of their own. Uh, there is not much going on in those places. Uh, I, you know, I don't know how much else goes on in Peoria, Illinois, where, where Bradley was. Well, I lived in Lawrence, Kansas back in the 60s, yeah. and I, you know, I know what you're speaking about. Lovely place, wonderful place, yeah. but nothing's happened. That's right. Yeah. And so the uh, high school teams or the college teams Except Those? the basketball team. Excuse me, that's your point, really. Uh, there's what? nothing happening except the basketball that's team exactly, and the football team. That's yeah. right. They, they become, you know, enormous heroes. They're, they're, yeah. they're, they're extolled. You have fathers who, who are asking for autographs from their son's high school teammates, which is totally ludicrous to begin with. <laughs> uh, and so w when something like this happens, they tend to take care of these guys. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Whatever they did, so they made a mistake, but they're, they're ours, they're our own, they're one of us, they're our heroes. In New York City, you had a whole other dimension. And took it more seriously, I think. You, you were not getting that latitude. I mean, the idea of, of going to City College to begin with was considered such an enormous privilege. Yeah, yeah. That you turned around and spat on. You know, there, there, was, there was that instinct as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you went there when others could have gone there. For every person that gets in, there's probably somebody who just didn't make it. Right, right. And we overcame this picture that the rest of the country had of us. Right. And now we were heroes, and now they understood that we can play with them. And now you, you smudged it, you dirtied it. Right. And right. so it was a, a terrible thing in, in, in New York. Yeah. Uh, and, and the small towns covered it up. I mean, if you want real justice, which is difficult to get anyway, you know, you're much better off trying a big city than a small town. It's yeah. a small town. Everybody knows everyone from the judge to the cop on the beat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You also said, and I, I think uh, that what you have just said explains why you, ha you said that New York, to a greater extent than the small towns, which considered themselves the repositories of Amer American virtue, the Midwest and the South, it's always in the rural West, it's always mm -hmm. been that way. New York, nonetheless, considered itself to some extent the moral conscience of the nation. Absolutely. And, and, and by the, so, why don't you comment on that, and also on, on your opinion of whether that in, isn't still, in fact, true today? Well, it was then. I think it, I think it is now, too. Uh, I, I, to me, anyway, I, I bring to it all the prejudices of, of a native New Yorker. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But the notion that it's the Midwest that has the fundamental bedrock American values, I dispute from the top. because. It was New York who took in the immigrants. Mm -hmm. I mean, the uh, the oppressed and and the oppressed masses huddled here. Mm -hmm. We gave free educations to sons of immigrants and grandsons of slaves. Mm -hmm. They didn't do that out there in Kansas. They weren't doing it in, in uh, Adolph Rupp's Kentucky. We were doing it here. Mm -hmm. And to me, this is what America is about. Mm -hmm. America is about New York. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when I say New York, I mean there are other urban areas too. But New York is is really what American values, that you're all welcome here. We take everybody and, and, and we help them. We give them free education. They weren't getting free educations out there. Uh, this was the place, you know, I could bring my father, my father was an immigrant, came from Romania. Mm -hmm. And he came over here at around the age of seven, mm -hmm. or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. And he used to tell me how he was put in the first grade and he didn't know the language and how to learn the language and everything else. By the time mm -hmm. he was 16 years old, he was in city college. Mm -hmm. And he went there for a year, his father had a stroke, he had to go to work very frequently told story, and so he was finished with that. But to him, to him, New York was, was the whole world. Right, right. I mean, we came, you know, from what he would say, we came from me, we weren't allowed to have books, we weren't allowed to go to school, we weren't allowed any of this. Right. And they came to New York and they give you the books for nothing. Right. 
and you go right. to school for nothing, right. and you go to college for nothing, and they give you the books for nothing. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, this to him was uh, was a miracle. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so New York and City College, I mean, that are the highest places on earth. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it was that way to a lot of those folks. Right. S Stan, uh, just to change your, of course, a lot of what you're talking about, the schism between the big cities, including New York, and the, and the, the rural areas, is still true today. The 2000 sure elections is. show that, Absolutely. Uh, you know, they, there, are, there are these maps of the counties, and it's like 6,000 counties to 600, and the 600 are all the East Coast, the West Coast, mm -hmm. Chicago, Detroit, and a few other big cities. When it came time to uh, sentence the ballplayers, uh, the judge, Saul Street, uh, I guess by your lights, and you make a good case, uh, didn't really uh, award punishment in light with, uh, of either his uh, alleged criteria or the actual facts, uh, and instead seemed to punish people, uh, certain people for other reasons and let people off with uh, probation or no, no prison for other. Why don't you describe a little bit what Judge Street did? Well, Saul Street, it struck me, and I, I don't know the man, never, never met him. Uh, I, did, I say in the book that he represented a different time, a different generation. Uh, this is the kind of generation I just described that my father believed in. Also, these places were holy. Mm -hmm. Now, here you had, people thought maybe it was racial prejudice. I don't think it was racial prejudice. I think it was a kind of cultural elitism, yeah. if anything. Uh, racial he, prejudice because he sent two out of four people he sent to prison were African Americans. Right. Yeah. But th those people also had, you know, something in their background that was untoward, a conviction for gang activity or whatnot. And, and Judge Street felt that basically the privileges you get when you come here, you should be walk the line. Now, he, here you had people who had transgressions in the past, which shows that you haven't learned anything. And, uh, I, it, it's not that I endorse that kind of, of judgment. Uh, I, I was totally against it. Yeah. And he let people off on the basis of the fact, and right. this is understandable, yeah. but it's nonetheless a fact. He let people off on the basis of the fact that they were veterans of World War II right. and or he liked their family backgrounds. Right. He, somebody who's a veteran of World War II, he got a break. Well, actually, he offered people, and Al Roth took it. Mm -hmm. Al Roth was going to jail. He was a white uh, player from the city. Uh, he told him, either you go into the Army, yeah. Enlist and do service time. Yeah. Show that you're a solid citizen in America, or else you're going to jail. Yeah. So Roth yeah. went into the army. Yeah. But I th those were his values. They were old world values. As I say in the book, uh, you know, he uh, where have you gone, Joe DiMaggio? He didn't know. Right. That that uh, that Joe and Joe had left and gone away. You yeah, know. Didn't go on away. Yeah. Uh, Stan, we have to leave and go away. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Our time is up. Thank you very much. It thank was you a very pleasure much. To I enjoyed it, it was very a, much. Thank you. It was a pleasure to read the book. It was a pleasure to see the documentary based largely on the book. And uh, best of luck with your next work. Thanks very much. Be with us again for our next show on Books of Our Time. Celebrate the 225-year history of those proud few who have earned the title Marine. This is the story.
story about a group of kids who volunteered. There's something nice for someone. We fix stuff. This is the Mark Project with the kids. We fixed up his house. We worked in the woods. Cleaned up the park. Did something for the planet. We just did it. No other reason. Bigger things to be afraid of. Like monsters from outer space. Remember, friends come in all colors.